Thanks for listening to this archive of Teaching American History's Documents in Detail webinar for Wednesday, March 17th, 2021. The focus of this program is Abraham Lincoln's final Emancipation Proclamation. As usual, our moderator was Dr. John Moser of Ashland University, and he was joined by Dr. Lucas Morell of Washington and Lee University and Dr. Jason Jividen of St. Vincent College. Thanks for listening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Moser, Professor of History and Chair of the Department of History and Political Science at Ashland University and Chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government Program at Ashland University. Welcome to another episode of Documents in Detail, Teaching American History's webinar series in which we bring together thoughtful scholars to have a conversation about historically significant documents. We encourage all of you joining us today to participate in that conversation by submitting questions via the Q&A box. Please the Q&A box and not the, the chat box. I, I can only really manage to follow one of those. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Within the next week, you will receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from tonight's program. The speeches, letters, and other writings that we're using for this year's webinars are all drawn from our book, 50 Core American Documents. They are also available at the Ashbrook Center's voluminous document database located at tah.org. The subject of today's program is Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, and to help discuss it are Dr. Lucas Morell, John K. Boardman, Jr., Professor of Politics at Washington and Lee University, and Dr. Jason Jividen, Associate Professor of Politics in the McKenna School of Business, Economics, and Government at St. Vincent College. Both are also faculty members at Ashland University's Master's Program in American History and Government, I should point out. Gentlemen, thank you for being here tonight. Thanks for the invite. Thank you, John. Yep, thank you. I always start these uh, these things by asking a general question. What it, why is this document so important as to be included in a volume called 50 Core Documents? Jason gets first stab. I'll take it away. Uh, you know, John, I, I was thinking, I know that you like to ask that question, so I came prepared this time thinking about why would we include it in a 50 core documents volume. Um, I think it, it stands on its own as thinking a bit about Lincoln's statesmanship and thinking a bit about the, the progress of the Civil War and how Lincoln understood emancipation. Um, but as a political scientist, I teach uh, the U.S. Constitution, I teach political institutions, and so I was thinking a bit about the fact that I often use this to talk about just the virtue of prudence in statesmanship itself, thinking a bit about how to take an abstract good or to try to achieve certain notions of justice, but in light of the circumstances on the ground. And so Lincoln's trying to fulfill some kind of good here, obviously in emancipation, but through certain constitutional and political strictures. Um, the Constitution very much guides the Emancipation Proclamation. I think that's why a lot of folks sometimes struggle with the proclamation to understand it, its limited nature, its procedural language. Um, it's not the high rhetoric of the Gettysburg Address or the second inaugural. Um, it's something that I found students struggle with. Um, to really understand what's going on. And I found it's a really great piece to use to teach um, notions of constitutionalism, notions of uh, commander in chief power, executive authority, but also just the very notion of prudence, trying to attach yourself to some good in light of the circumstances on the ground. And this is very much, uh, if you know anything about the trajectory of Lincoln on emancipation, it very much reflects the circumstances on the ground. And Lincoln is able to do something um, as commander in chief, he was not able to do while out of office and something he would not have been able to have done under other normal circumstances. And so I think it's a really good piece to use for all sorts of reasons. That's a fantastic introduction. I'm, I'm not gonna add uh, much to it because we can get into more of the nitty gritty as this thing goes along. Um, uh, Lincoln called it the central act of my administration. And so he, he, he knew it, uh, of its importance, not just to what he was trying to do during the war and for America, but he, if you will, the world historic importance of it. Um, and so uh, at least he thought it was the most important thing that, that he would do, that he would be remembered for. And he was someone who of course wanted to be remembered. He was interested in, in um, not just pursuing fame, but pursuing fame for a noble end. And uh, as uh, Jason mentioned, was not able to do this, uh, if you will, um, through strictly political means. In other words, strictly through the consent of the governed uh, during a time of peace. Uh, in fact, his first inaugural when the nation was not at war, 
he said he wasn't going to touch slavery where it exists. So it's a wonderful way uh, if you're teaching a class. You, you begin with Lincoln when he begins his presidency, March 4th, 1861, and it's uh, not going to touch it. The Republican Party says they believe in the, 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 what they call the rights of the states, states' rights. Um, he neither had the, the power nor the inclination. He, I mean, things are so bad. Lincoln has to say it's not even something I would want to do if I had the authority to do it. Uh, but he was speaking during a time of peace. So uh, as I put it to my students, I sum it up by saying that Lincoln had to figure out, and the Constitution is key, he had to figure out how to turn a humanitarian end into a constitutional means in order for it to be a legitimate action by the federal government in particular by executive authority. And I'm sure we're gonna parse, parse some of that out as we go along. Yeah, before we get into the substance of the document itself, maybe it would be, uh, it would be good to, to, to have an overview of how we got from the Lincoln of 1861 to the Lincoln of, 18, of, of uh, late 1862, where, where he first in, in announces his intent to uh, issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Lucas, you want to take the first crack and I'll, I'll follow um, you this time. I, I always go back to, and this is a good resource for your teachers, a good friend of mine, Alan Gelzo, wrote a book called Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. And um, that sounds like a fairly mundane uh, title, but it, it, it actually is a very pregnant title. In other words, there were several Emancipation Proclamations during the war, and Alan wanted to focus on what made Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation singular. Lincoln's plan A was not an executive military order. This was actually issued on January 2nd. Following the actual proclamation, the next day was issued as a military order, General Orders Number 1. So we wanted to make sure the military rank and file knew, you guys are a part of my making this thing stick. Um, but his plan A was not a federal edict. His plan A was for the states to emancipate. And by that, I mean those states that were slaveholding but still loyal to the Union, Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri. And he first approached uh, Delaware, I believe it was December of 1861, so within the first year of the war, then in March and in July of the following year, when the war is still plodding along, uh, Lincoln makes an appeal to what he called the so-called border slave states. And he says, look, we will loan you the money, at least get the ball rolling, start, uh, approve a policy of gradual emancipation so that we put away any um, idea that the South is going to get bigger as a Confederacy by drawing in other sister slaveholding states. So he wanted it to be demoralizing, but most of all, he, it, he wanted it to be ironclad in terms of its constitutionality. It would be indisputable. No one could take that to a court of law. If a state decides to ban slavery or if they amend their constitution, five of six states do this before the end of the war. If the states got rid of slavery, Lincoln's like, mission accomplished. That is incontestable, not controversial. And so that's his plan A. And as I mentioned, Gelzo's book does a really good job of showing you all the other things Lincoln did before he finally announced September 22nd, 1862, that he was going to 100 years, 100 years, 100 days hence, January 1, declare what areas it would apply to. Yeah, there's not a lot I can add there other than to say I was thinking a bit about even back into the 1850s, Lincoln, oh, right. you know, before the war, but talking about sort of what is this path of ultimate extinction that the founders talked about, about placing slavery on this path. And I think always he is consistent, as Lucas said, to think about a constitutional path to stopping the spread of slavery into the territories. Once Sumter happens, happens the whole environment changes, but yet there's some real nuances and shadows that still remain that he had, he had said for years, he was on record as part of what his first inaugural is about, is reminded people of what he was on record as having said all the way back to the 1850s. Mm -hmm. And in almost every case, uh, Lucas mentioned gradual compensated emancipation, that's a constant theme, even shows up in the preliminary September early version of the Emancipation Proclamation. But there was also, and, and controversially today, I think people struggle when they read this, are the arguments for colonization, which were also tied to his emancipation plan all the way back to the 1850s. And that too shows up in the preliminary emancipation. So um, by January of 63, there's kind of a doubling down, which is suggest we have tried these, these not, not piecemeal, but um, trying to reach out to the border states, even trying to reach out to the South, hoping that emancipation would come consensually. Right. Uh, but now we understand that's not gonna happen. And so the preliminary September 62 uh, proclamation is very much sort of a shot across the bow. Here's what's gonna happen. Here's how we want to sweeten the pot. 
by the time you get to January 63, um, it's a much more assertive, I, the executive, am going to do X under military authority. You don't see any notion uh, there of colonization. It's not there anymore. You don't see the notion of, of, of compensation. So it shifts a bit in those 100 days. Uh, but there is a kind of continuity to what Lincoln's been saying for many, many years about what a constitutional version of emancipation would ultimately have to look like, um, which, of course, ultimately is going to require constitutional amendment. Is, is this something that, that, that Lincoln really wanted to do, or did he feel as though, this, sorry, this is, this is based on a question by Heath Treat, uh, or, is this, or did he feel like he was painted into a corner? Well, as I understand it, I mean, I'm always reminded of um, is it Richard Hofstadter, Lucas, the famous line that the, 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 the reluctant emancipator, uh, Lerone Bennett, um, Julius Lester, lots of folks, even uh, Thomas DiLorenzo, the, story, yeah. the economist these days writing his story. Um, but the, uh, the idea that he was the reluctant emancipator, um, I'm not someone who really shares that view, if only in the sense that Lincoln was on record for his entire career suggesting that he was naturally anti-slavery, that he wasn't sure what he could do about it other than to try to pursue constitutional means, again, would require an amendment. You're not going to get rid of slavery in the states until there's an amendment, which at one time would have seemed impossible. And so um, I do think that political necessity and, and military necessity might very much have required emancipation, but that doesn't mean that Lincoln was necessarily um, half-hearted or reluctant. I, I, to say that he's enthusiastic might also be a stretch only because this is serious business, right? When you're engaged, what are you gonna do after emancipation? How do you deal with, is the time ripe or not? So if we mean reluctant in that sense, I think that just means cautious. But to suggest that he's somehow, um, not somehow dedicated to the cause of emancipation or not, not dedicated to the cause of natural rights or the equality principle to me, just gives short shrift to just most of the record as, as far as what he said. Um, the, the number one source you usually find when people make that claim that he was a reluctant emancipator is the letter to Horace Greeley, which wow. says that if I could save the union without freeing a single slave, I would do it. If I could save the union with freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And people often say, aha, he's not really committed to emancipation. He's just talking about saving the union. But notice he says in that letter, my prelim or what is it, primary objective or paramount objective, something like that. I'm not quoting it perfectly. It's not that his sole objective, if he could have emancipation and union, he would do that. In fact, I would even go a step further and say, if you don't save the union, and if you don't save the constitution, you're not going to get emancipation anyway. Right. And so union and emancipation and, and are really tied together in an inextricable um, connection. Yeah, I would just add quickly that Lincoln was at pains to tie means to ends. And so in the case of emancipation, the end for him was clear to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. It's in his oath, the only oath of the federal officer uh, spelled out in the Constitution. They all swear an oath. The president is actually in, so nominated in the bond, as Frederick Douglass would say. Um, but Lincoln, to be a self-governing people, we had to be a constitutional people. And that means a people who govern peacefully, politically, through words, through reason, uh, and that means by their consent. And in a time of war, you can make people do things with bullets and ballot, uh, uh, bullets and uh, bayonets, I meant to say. And it, yeah, they might be obeying on the outside, but they're disobeying on the inside, as we found out at, when we tried to um, uh, restore federal authority, Lincoln's preferred term, restoration. But during Reconstruction, um, it was only with military occupation that Blacks and uh, sympathetic whites from the North, Republicans, uh, uh, who were governing there. It was only when uh, it, 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 they were essentially an occupied people that you could uh, reap the benefits, as it were, of, of the right side winning the Civil War. But as soon as they were removed, you, you know, the, the Blacks were at the mercy uh, of, of the whites who were unrepentant. They were, you know, they called these redeemed, you know, they borrowed a Christian term, redeemed governments, right? They got rid of bayonet rule. And that Lincoln was well aware that what you can accomplish by bullets and bayonets um, are, are, are in the truest sense, not the best things you accomplish politically. And that's by persuading people, uh, gaining those political majorities. And that's a tough thing to do. Um, and he was willing to do that as long as that was the, the best game in town, but push came to literal shove. Um, he found, uh, as Jason mentioned already, military necessity in addition to constitutional authority to do the right thing. Puts me in mind of a uh, quote by Napoleon: "You can do many things with a bayonet, but you cannot sit on them. <laughs> you, can't, you can't govern with them." Uh, it's sort of a follow-up, and and I'll, and I'll let you know I'm not strictly going in order that the questions were submitted. I'm trying to group them together thematically. Uh, our old friend Skip Larue asks, uh, 
Uh, what about the role that some Union generals played in forcing Lincoln's hand by issuing orders of their own? Well, he did that famously twice. Um, uh, the ones that come immediately to mind are Fremont and Hunter. And in both cases, he revoked the orders or at least parts of the orders. And in deference to their own authority, he actually told Fremont, I don't want to order you to do this. Just do this because uh, I want you to do this. And Fremont said, no, make me. <laughs> Lincoln said, fine. <laughs> and so in both cases, Lincoln made it clear if something like that was going to happen, it had to be, it had to happen in a particular way broadly speaking, a constitutional way. And he would be the one to be the prime mover on it. Generals don't get the discretion to do that. They have to follow his, um, uh, and again, as Jason mentioned our, our earlier, uh, Lincoln is the commander in chief. He has the grand strategy in mind and he's got all the things he has to take into account like keeping Kentucky in the union, right? The old canard about Lincoln uh, wanting to have God on his side. Lincoln said, I'd love to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. <laughs> Right. To lose Kentucky is to lose the whole thing. And and so there were there were those facts on the ground that Lincoln had to consider as well. So I don't believe if you want to say anybody forced Lincoln's hand, it was the free the slaves themselves who were fleeing to union lines. As soon as Lincoln was elected, they thought that meant emancipation and there wasn't any war yet. Uh, Gelzo's book opens with the story of a slave seizing a rowboat. <laughs> to cross, uh, I forget what, what uh, uh, bay it was, but here's the guy who says, <clears throat> Lincoln's not Buchanan, he's on my side, he's not a doe face, um, he's going to uh, take my side. And of course that wasn't exactly true, uh, but it was a policy that Lincoln had and his cabinet had to develop in an ad hoc fashion. They did not know what to do with all these fleeing, uh, uh, formerly enslaved, uh, uh, primarily men. Yeah, I think Lucas has this exactly right. If anything, the example of Fremont and Hunter shows how willing Lincoln was to stick to the idea that you had to have the consent of the border states in order to have emancipation. That's why he revokes it. it it's certainly true to say it has to come from the commander in chief, but there has to first be the argument of military necessity. And if you're in a place that's not an open rebellion, and if you know tensions are, are not as high, and if you're in a border state that's loyal to the Union, then you can't really make the argument of military necessity the way he could elsewhere. And so what it actually does is undermines his long-term plan for emancipation. And also it gives up an awful lot in trying to massage and caress and, and court those border states to keep them on your side. That's absolutely crucial. In fact, without the support of the border states, you might never get emancipation at all. And so I, I don't know that the general's force his hand as much as allow him to reveal um, the way the plan's going to go. And, and, and with hindsight being 2020, we understand exactly what he was up to. Um, but it's politics, right? And that's part of statesmanship is having to make these judgments that might be very unpopular in some circles, but are part of the long-term plan. And um, Lincoln played it perfectly um, in that regard. You're getting some questions about the uh, the name the the name and author of the book you mentioned. It's Alan Gelzo, G U E L Z O. He has spoken in Ashland on a couple of uh, on a couple of occasions. He's a he's a very uh, entertaining speaker. Yes. Uh, and the book is Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, let's see. So we got a few more uh, questions about the, the origins of this document. Um, how influ Joshua Wagner asks, how influential were the abolitionists in, in getting Lincoln to this, uh, to this stage? Lucas, you want to take the first crack at that? Uh, sure. Um, I think the consensus among historians is um, that they were essentially six months ahead of Lincoln, <laughs> more or less, which it's not quite true. Um, the, the real rock-ribbed abolitionists like uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, Wendell Phillips, Garrett Smith, and, and, and so on, they wanted the war to be an abolition war from the jump. And in fact, even before the war began, they wanted uh, a Republican administration to ban slavery in the, in, you know, through Congress, uh, not, the, um, not the president outright, but they wanted Congress to, they thought Congress um, uh, had the authority to ban slavery, not just in the territories, but where it already existed in the states. And Lincoln was not on board with that. So there were some principled reasons why Lincoln was clearly anti-slavery in conviction and in policy but would never and never did call himself an abolitionist. So what the abolitionists did that was helpful for Lincoln was to keep, of course, the, the, the moral enormity of slavery on the front burner of people's minds. And um, another great um, Civil War historian, James McPherson, the greatest living Civil War historian, in my opinion, 
Um, he wrote a book called For Cause and Comrades. It's a slender book. I uh, might've even won the Lincoln Prize. Lincoln, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was one of Allen's three <laughs> Lincoln Prizes. Uh, but, but McPherson reads you know, hundreds if not thousands of these diaries and letters from Union and uh, rebel soldiers. And he finds that the Union soldiers over time as they make their way South and as they actually see what slavery is doing to human beings, they in a way become converts, not all of them, of course, uh, but at, a, at the beginning of their war, their letters are filled with stuff like, this isn't an abolition war, I'm going home if, it if, if the president wants that. And then when they actually see the ravages of slavery, um, they, they see these humans, uh, these human beings um, treated uh, in horror, you know, the effects of, of this treatment, and they become sympathetic. And so um, you know, to that extent, um, uh, again, the, the horror of slavery itself, helpful to keep in the Northern public mind, and it's reinforced as the war progresses by letters home saying, you wouldn't believe what we uh, have witnessed down here. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add to that. You mentioned Frederick Douglass. Um, you know, many abolitionists, I won't say all abolitionists, but many abolitionists and many prominent abolitionists would have advocated for emancipation and some often by any means necessary, but they disagreed with Lincoln on some political matters, on some constitutional matters. But for some, say William Lloyd Garrison, for example, there's a real indifference, if not hostility, to the strictures that the Constitution might place on what they see as a moral good, right? This is a matter of justice, not a matter of adhering to the letter of the law. And, and for Lincoln, that's simply not true. It has to be a constitutional solution to the problem. And so to suggest that Lincoln uh, is an abolitionist, um, if, if when folks sometimes do, that often gives short shrift to the real um, uh, legal and principle distinctions between how Lincoln thought about how to attack the problem and how many abolitionists did. But Frederick Douglass is interesting because even Frederick Douglass in his speech, I think it's the speech for the, uh, the Freedmen's Memorial in DC. It's the famous one where he says that um, Lincoln was the white man's president, however, right? In those howevers, he suggests that one need not judge too harshly his cautious, maybe tepid approach to emancipation because had he not done so, he would have lost such a significant portion of the political support that he needed in the long term, read the border states and many people in Congress, he would have lost political support that would have been an absolute lost cause in the long run. You might have had some military declaration of emancipation, but you probably wouldn't have got the 13th Amendment later. And so I think Douglas understands something about the way that Lincoln um, had to approach the situation that's different than some other abolitionists. There's a concern there for the rule of law and constitutionalism that you wouldn't find in someone like Garrison uh, and many others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This gets directly to uh, a couple of questions who are asking about the relationship between uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. Was, was Lincoln, uh, do you see Lincoln as intentionally laying the groundwork for a constitutional amendment? I, I think that that had been on, on the front burner and on the table as the, the ultimate consequence or the ultimate solution all along. I mean, that's what underlies the whole suggestion going all the way back to 1854, which is to say we're going to try to keep slavery out of the territories. However, um, we should remember that we have the power to do that. We can't touch it in states. Absent a con the, you know, the reason we can't touch it in states is you would need a constitutional amendment, right? So all along the reason we knew that that wasn't feasible is we weren't going to get a constitutional amendment because no deep south state would ratify it. But the territories were another matter, right? Because they're under federal control and Article 3 says we can make all needful rules and regulations for the territory. And at that point, that's what the fight was over. But all along, it had been well understood that if you're gonna talk about emancipation in any lasting constitutional nationwide way, it had to be an amendment to the constitution. So even if it's not being stated explicitly, I think that had always been understood in the debates over emancipation. I think that's right. What do you, what do you think, Lucas? Yeah, I, I would add this. I mean, it, it's not that we have Lincoln putting down on paper, <laughs> you know, emancipation and then 13th Amendment. Um, uh, but it was clear there's a, and this is really helpful, especially for the teachers. Um, make sure your students know that there's a difference between emancipation and abolition. Emancipation it, or manumission is what happens when a legal slave becomes free in the eyes of the law. But notice, what haven't you done? You have not abolished the institution of slavery. That requires a separate act, either a new law or more fundamentally, a constitutional amendment within a particular state. So once emancipation was issued as a military order, Lincoln's all abiding concern was what happens when the war is over? 
Okay, let's say all you know the states are, have come are, are, are back in the union. Well, guess what? Laws are still on the books. All those laws in the border slave states and the deep south states, all those laws and constitutional uh, provisions protecting slavery are still there. They didn't disappear just because they lost a war. Okay. And so um, Lincoln understood, I believe more so after he, he finally decided to issue an emancipation proclamation upon military necessity, constitutional, et cetera. Uh, at that point, he recognized, you know what, once this war is over, we, we've got to come, we just got to be quit of this institution. And now it really does require a constitutional amendment. We have to get rid of not just the legalization of particular slaves, right? The legalization of enslaving this or that person or persons, we got to get rid of slavery. And he says, you know, when the 13th Amendment was, was finally passed by the House in January, it was passed by the Senate the previous year in 64, uh, in January 65, when Daniel Day Lewis frees, uh, uh, when Daniel Day Lewis, uh, never mind. Anyway, when, 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 when Congress finally gets two thirds of both houses to pass the amendment, now it has to go to the states. Lincoln says, it's a king's cure for all the evils that wraps the thing up. And now, right, you're not afraid of it be, being taken to court. You're not afraid of, of any kind of lingering uh, question with regards to, well, wait a second, are we back to the status quo ante, or you know, have have, have we really fundamentally um, gotten rid of uh, the actual institution? For abolition, it took an amendment. Got a couple questions about sources. Uh, one question simply would like uh, to repeat the uh, the title of the McPherson book. For cause and comrades, and I'm going to ha hasten. And that's James McPherson. He wrote Battle Cry Freedom. A spectacular, I mean, it's kind of dated now. It's 1988, 89. Um, been several Civil War books published since then. But boy, my goodness, that thing reads really well. And it's just a fantastic book in a number of other ways. Um, I I'm going to add another book uh, that you have to read if you want to deep dive into how abolition and how emancipation transpired in this country. And it takes, it, it's not exactly, it, it, it'll, it, it's in some um, uh, conversation, shall we say, with Alan Gelzo. And I'm in Alan Gelzo's camp in, this, in terms of, of this debate, but um, uh, James Oakes, O-A-K-E-S, he wrote a book called Freedom National. It's a big book, print's pretty big too, but that book gets you into the weeds prior to the war, but especially during the war, you almost have a month by month, if not day by day account of how the Lincoln administration, Republicans in Congress, generals in the field, what they're actually doing with regards to the, 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 you know, the, the moving ball that was the state of slavery in this or that state, including the so-called border slave states. And so I would put Gelzo's book, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in conversation with uh, James Oakes's book, Freedom National, uh, quickly, the thesis of, of Oakes's books is that the Emancipation Proclamation is actually a misnomer. It should be called the Enticement Proclamation. He, contrary to Alan Gelzo, I hope this is helpful, James Oakes argues that Lincoln was simply executing the will of Congress's confiscation acts. And there were two, 61 and in 62. All Lincoln was doing was carrying out the legislative will as it was spelled out, especially in the Second Confiscation Act. Contrary to that view, Gelzo thinks, no, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation as a result of his own war powers. And that's not a phrase that appears in the Constitution, but that's what we, were, that's what we mean when we, Lincoln puts on the hat of commander in chief when he reminds people of what his role is in terms of his oath to preserve, protect, and defend, make sure the laws are faithfully executed, all that stuff, war powers. Um, and so there's, I think there's a very useful um, debate, dialogue, conversation between two giants of Civil War historians uh, in our day and age. I, I'm, I'm persuaded by, by Alan and my own reading in conclusions about what Lincoln was doing, but Oakes's book, you, I say, that was a game changer when that book was published, and you cannot talk responsibly about emancipation without engaging James Oakes. Just add two little things. I'm a, I'm a political theorist, I say political philosophy, but also American government. And two um, two pieces that were really 
really shaped the way that I think about the Emancipation Proclamation, really just Lincoln's statesmanship in general. One is a book called Abraham Lincoln, A Constitutional Biography by George Anna Stoffway. Yeah. There is a fantastic chapter in that book on prudence in the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, in fact, I, in preparing for this, I just glanced at it again and remembered what a fantastic chapter that is and really captures a lot of what Lucas and I are talking about here and relating it to broader themes of, of statesmanship. Mm -hmm. The other is a friend, another uh, faculty member in the MAG and a friend of ours, Joe Fornieri, has a fantastic essay that's been reprinted a few different places called um, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, colon, a model of prudential statesmanship, something to that effect. I think it's pretty close. And he really captures, as well as anyone I've ever seen in a nice short article, the, the notion that there are overlapping concerns here of uh, jurisdictional questions and constitutional authority and how Lincoln had to navigate um, this idea of consent and trying to handle emancipation. It probably captures it in a shorter space than any article, I can, any contemporary article I can think of. So uh, Anastopoulos' book and Fournieri's article uh, will get you pretty far. Another question on sources. Uh, Jason Pope asks if there is any resource that has compiled those soldiers' letters. This would be the kind of thing that would be nice to get in front of students. Well, the for cause and comrades is oh, oh he means an edited collection. That's right, oh, a collection geez. of the letters themselves. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, I would check Amazon. <laughs> on that. Not one that d doesn't come readily to mind. Sorry. Yeah. Does it, McPherson has a doesn't is it McPherson that had I think it's McPherson had one coming from the other angle of the letters of Northern soldiers, thinking about um, I'm trying to remember the title. I'll look it up here and see. Um, but trying to remember the title, but sort of the other direction of of Northern soldiers' experiences and thinking about what what were they fighting for? What did the average soldier you know think they were well, fighting the war for? for? Cause and comrades that. covered both sides of the Mason Dixon line, and I, yeah. I know that other book you're referring to, and I, the title escapes me right now. A couple more questions about the origins of the policy. Uh, John Talley asks, "What about Benjamin Butler, and what role did he play in this?" Oh, massive. Okay, uh, let me let me give the other one, and then maybe you can take one both at once. And what role, if any, did the Port Royal experiment? Uh, what role did, did, did that play in Lincoln's policy? Um, I'm aware of what happened in Port Royal, which was, if I'm not mistaken, this is down in the, it was this the islands off South Carolina's coast where the blacks were allowed to um, essentially take over the lands that they had been um, uh, treated as bondsmen, unrequited toil, as Lincoln puts it in the second inaugural. Is that, is that the one? But uh, after the war, Johnson uh, revokes all that and gives the land back uh, to the former rebels. If, if, if I remember that one, Benjamin Butler, uh, you have to read Oakes's book to get Butler. Butler is no Republican whatsoever, but boy, is he a stickler for the law and the constitution. And so if you were a slave who was escaping a loyal American citizen, it, Butler was, this was a slam, it was obvious, there was no debate here, you have to be returned to your master. But if you're a slave who escapes from someone who's actually shooting at an American soldier or sailor, Butler is like, hmm, I don't think we should do that. But what the president hasn't told us, and he would send that one up the chain. And so uh, Oakes's book is masterful in showing the, the, sorry, but the ad hoc development of policy toward what the press called contraband, these fleeing slaves into human union lines and into the Navy warships. Um, Oakes's book tells that story very well about basically the kind of the back and forth between what's happening on the ground and generals wanting to know, do we send them back or we don't? And if we don't, we don't have food for these people. And what do we do with their wives and their children? Um, and there's some harrowing stories there where the Navy takes off and doesn't take the slaves with them. And you just, I mean, you're just, he sets it up where you're like, oh my goodness, we know what's gonna happen because they weren't taken uh, uh, into, uh, they, they didn't find refuge in the Union Army or in the Navy. And so uh, Butler, the story of Butler, um, I haven't done this because I've got a day job, but uh, I would like to read a very good biography of Butler because this is a guy who his biography leading up to the Civil War, you would never have predicted. He would play such an important and useful and productive role in the development of a policy that eventually led Lincoln to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. I'll just add one thing. I can't improve on any of that. I'll just add one thing. In the preliminary proclamation back in September, it's not in the final, Lincoln references an act of Congress that had been passed that same year. Um, and it's got a long name. It's something like along the lines of an act to punish treason and confiscate contraband, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
and he just cites that act, quotes it, you know, and gives you two or three paragraphs from the act. And it's the exact same question that's coming up. Congress is basically saying, we're inviting fugitive slaves, right? We're inviting people to flee. If you come, it's, it's almost like you said earlier, an enticement, right? Lincoln is as much as suggesting that along with this congressional act, acting in pursuance thereof, it's much more moderated in terms of claiming executive authority, right? He's saying, in pursuance of this act, know that if you flee, there might be a place for you. And it's the setup for just a few months later for saying we're actively going to recruit folks into the military. Right, um, because but, prior to that, if I can interject, yeah. prior to Please, that, yeah. the, the order to the generals was you uh, you do not entice them to flee from their masters. And Lincoln right. said, we've got enough on our hands. We yep. don't need to we don't need to complicate things. We've got to win a war. And so right. the gen for about uh, I want to say a year, it was probably less than a year, but middle of 61 through about spring of 62, the generals are told, don't go after slaves, don't entice them. In other words, there's a policy for if they come to you, right? <laughs> and there's a policy of you, you know, uh, if they don't, then don't mess with them, don't disturb them. We really have got enough on our hands. Yeah. Uh, to fight this war, to prosecute this war successfully. But come, whew, certainly by May and June, when Lincoln, I think, is beginning to draft, certainly by July, he's got it drafted. There's some evidence that he had drafted it as early as June. By that point, Lincoln is now ready to issue an Emancipation Proclamation, and he's convinced by one of his cabinet members, I, always, I forget if it's Seward or Chase, who says, look, we're not doing very well in the field. We probably ought to win a significant battle first, <clears throat> so it looks like we can actually enforce this thing, and that significant battle is and Tatum. Right. Uh, a couple of speakers came uh, came forward, or speakers, uh, uh, participants came forward with uh, with with titles of, of books that are relevant. Uh, one on the subject of letters from Civil War soldiers, a book called Johnny Reb and Billy Yank, Letters from oh, Civil yeah. War Soldiers. That's a classic one. That's an old one, I think. I, and I then, just it, oh, go ahead, please, sorry. Oh, I... Uh, one that says, Dr. Jividen, I believe you were trying to remember The Union War by Gary Gallagher. That's not what I was trying to remember, but oh, that's, that's awesome too. So I'll put that down. But I will tell you what I, what I remembered is it's McPherson and it's called What They Fought For. Ah, um, of nice little nice little slim volume. You know, one setting reads. Great book. Uh, and someone has asked if if there's any way we can obtain a list of these books. We'll, we'll try to we'll try to get these all get these all together. Check the recording. It, it maybe 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 Jeremy can send these out with the uh, send it out with the uh, the email that you'll get after this. Uh, after this went this seminar, a webinar rather, uh, boy, wow! The, the, the questions just keep on coming, and there's so many. And there's I thought so we many answered books. everything, Jason. And I, we have covered the field. <laughs> right. Come on, right? I I, I don't have. The, I remember, uh, I, you know, in previous years, I would actually have to think up questions. Now I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting tons of them. Uh, there, are, uh, uh, Francis Zhuang and uh, and Zachary Rice both ask about the exceptions. That are spelled yeah. out in the in the document. Could you comment on that, please, Jason? You get first right of refusal. Well, yeah. I mean, the exceptions here are uh, as, as far as Lincoln's. And again, I'm not a, a great scholar on this, but Lincoln's understanding. Again, um, notice the 48 counties designated as West Virginia, which we were talking about um, before we actually logged on here. I'm from West Virginia, so we talked a little bit about that. Um, the exceptions here, as I understand it, are places that they were not entirely. Um, convinced that these were places disloyal to the Union. It wasn't necessarily places, parts of states in open rebellion. Um, the border states, of course, don't apply here. It's my understanding, though, that this was a controversial matter even in the cabinet. I know that Chase disagreed with this, making any exceptions whatsoever. Yeah. Um, but again, I'm not a, a real scholar of this. I just know that that's the reasoning. And again, it sort of undergirds this argument of military necessity. Um, so the exceptions within the states, the slaveholding states, that's why you get it. And then, of course, the border states, again, it's because um, without consent of those states, you don't have the military necessity argument with which to uh, to emancipate. But Lucas, you want to add to that? No, I mean, the, the <clears throat> shortest answer is the one that you just gave with two words, military necessity. Lincoln, it would rob the Emancipation Proclamation of its constitutional and um, war context rationale by just saying, oh, might as well just, you know, uh, all of the states. For example, Tennessee is not mentioned. Why? Because his future vice president, Andrew Johnson, stayed in the Senate. He was the only loyal senator from a slaveholding state that seceded, that returned to his day job, you know, after, um, uh, the, after his state seceded. So uh, technically, it's representative. Remember, Lincoln says, on January 1st, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to designate, 
I'm going to spell out those areas or states entirely that are still in open rebellion. And he says the proof that they're not in rebellion, in other words, the proof that they're not trying to get their way through force is representation in Congress. And again, that sounds like a mundane thing, but Lincoln's like, no, that's self-government, that's consent, that's the constitution, that is obeying the very thing I think seceding citizens and states have not been doing. They have thrown off. They claim they don't, they are no longer obligated to obey federal authority. And so in those areas where they still are loyal, Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, Delaware, Tennessee, and then these other parts where it's not a military necessity because they are occupied, you know, sufficiently so by the Union Army and Navy. And so, um, again, this is, this, is, this is where the legalese and the, the, the weeds of it, right? <laughs> Good grief. This is, a, this is an order. This is a proclamation that doesn't begin four score and seven years ago. Our father. It begins. I, I do this with my students. I have a student just start reading. <laughs> from the beginning and the first word you know you're in trouble when the first word is whereas you're like ah i start snoring out loud a few sentences into it to show students there is a difference between the heavy lifting the actual work that lincoln intended the emancipation proclamation to do in contrast with what will later happen that year in november with a speech yeah. the, what turns out to be a few appropriate remarks is gettysburg uh, address. So all of that, you know, Arkansas, Georgia, all that, oh, except for these parishes in Louisiana, nah, nah, nah. all of that is because Lincoln is bound by the Constitution. He's bound by his understanding of what he can do as president and um, Constitution, military necessity. Um, those are those are it. I'll just, I'll just add one thing to that. And that's really just sort of spelling out or just sort of, you know, doubling down on one thing that Lucas said. Remember that for Lincoln, if we're going to talk about legalese, None of these states for Lincoln, the argument is consistent all the way through, was ever out of the Union. Correct. Right. That, that would be too much to concede to the notion of secession, to even some claims of revolution. The idea here is that you have a rebellion, right? Insurrection right. and rebellion. And so if you were never out of the Union and you have representation in Congress, you're not in rebellion, right? There's a sense in which those areas, which they are being represented in the Congress, they're still in the Union and not in rebellion and not outside. So you couldn't make any kind of argument that we're going to engage in some kind of military necessity argument when you're you're still part of the union and you have representation that's worth worth drawing out uh, a, a couple of of, of attendees have, have mentioned some things that are that are commonly said about the emancipation proclamation i'm going to try to weave these together uh, one of them is the is directly to, to what you said is the comparison of the emancipation proclamation to a quote bill of lading unquote a fair one Hofstetter. Uh, that's how I said it. Yeah, okay, and uh, and 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 then the other is the um, is the accusation that that or the suggestion that it's not really that important because it didn't free a single slave. Ah, I'm so <laughs> glad you asked that question, Jason. Uh, go after this first because I, I'll, I'll, I'll start part of it because really I, mean if I answer first. Well, you can answer first, but I'll, I'll say a couple things and just set the table for you, Lucas, because I've heard you <laughs> on some of these things before. The Hofstetter statements, right? In fact, Hofstetter said both of those things. Um, and, and if as long as we're going to sort of bring out Hofstetter, it's in a famous essay called Abraham Lincoln and the Self-Made Myth, right? And so it's a piece that in general is kind of considers itself at the time a kind of revisionist history taking on the hagiography of sort of holding up Father Abraham. And so the entire tone of the piece is to suggest that Lincoln was like any other politician, mired in politics, et cetera, et cetera. And I would argue that anyone that studies politics, understands, of course, he's a politician. That's yeah. what Lincoln is. He's also a statesman, the, the, the highest variety of politician. But this idea that it has all the moral grandeur of a bill of lading, what argument you could push back and say what you expect it to be. It's, it's, a, it's basically an executive proclamation. It's an order. Uh, this, isn't, uh, it's, this isn't a speech. It isn't poetry. It isn't the second inaugural. It certainly isn't the Gettysburg Address. Um, and I, I once saw the title of an article, and the author's name escapes me. Here's again, we'll have to put on our list. Isn't, there's an article somewhere along the lines of, um, a bill of lading brings home the goods or something <laughs> like that. And it's a fantastic title in the sense that if you know about a bill of lading, it's basically a bill of sale for certain goods and services. This got the job done in a way that at the time, with the circumstances on the ground, anything other than this would have been a mere speech. Um, this needed to take on the kind of rhetoric that it did. It needed to be procedural. It needed to be legal. It needed to be constitutional. In fact, Lincoln, the lawyerly Lincoln, is fantastic at this. Another place where you see this, not on this topic, but is, the, is in the message to Congress in special session, 
when he talks about dealing with the secessionists and what the executive did, what the government did, everything it's whereas, right? Everything is in the language of these things are a legal matter of course. Mm -hmm. And so what it does is it gives a certain legitimacy to something that is frankly among, among many very controversial. And I think there is a legitimacy to it. I don't think it's just sleight of hand, but um, my argument would be that this is precisely the kind of rhetoric you ought to have. Um, and uh, Lucas, I'll let you piggyback on that or go after the second one, which is that it didn't free a single slave. Right. Um, let's put it this way. But for a commander in chief ordering general orders, number one, January 2, 1863, ordering his Navy and Army to secure, make safe, protect the freedom of any self-emancipated slave, but for the federal government, instead of returning the slave to his master, his legal master. But for Lincoln deciding, I'm going to be refuge, you will not be an outlaw outside of the law's protection. You will not be a fugitive if you flee your statutory legal master. But for the federal government having bullets and bayonets in your defense, any self-emancipated slave would remain insecure in his freedom. The textbook example of this is the most famous black abolitionist of the 19th century, Frederick Douglass. He publishes his narrative in 1845, names names, pretty detailed account of how he escaped. Ah, what are you doing? Um, you know what he has to do within months of its publication? He has to flee the United States. Wait, I thought he escaped the Alds. I thought he was away from his legal master physically for a while. But according to the law and according to the constitution, if he was apprehended, he would be sent back. He was not safe in his freedom. He was way up in New England for a while and then in Rochester. Uh, but when that book came out in 1845, he fled, to New, uh, he fled to England and he was on a lecture tour for two years selling his narrative, his book. Um, I think there was an Irish copy, another copy. He was giving speeches for two years until what happened? What allowed him to come back to the United States? What enabled him not to be an outlaw? He was legally manumitted by friends of his, including, of all people, you're not going to believe this, William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison says in a letter, I contributed my widow's might to it. Because, of course, Garrison did not believe you should make co commerce of human beings, and that's what you were doing by freeing Frederick Douglass by paying for it. Douglass has this nice letter where he explains, or an editorial where he explains why well, I wouldn't pay one red cent for my own freedom, but I accepted this manumission by my abolitionist friend. So Douglass could come back safely to the United States. It wasn't a question of whether he was physically capable of translocating, right? Moving from point A to point B. The question is when you get to point B, unless it's Canada, which by the way, was the destination for fugitive slaves. It wasn't New York. It wasn't Bedford, Massachusetts. It was Canada. Because if you got outside of the United States, Canada was not going to extradite you. Okay? So the self-emancipation thesis, you know who's the best answer on this is? Lincoln in the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation and the Emancipation Proclamation. He says, this is what I'm going to do. And then here's the great line from the preliminary one, worth quoting. So glad. I think I actually secretly planted that question in the in the q a including says the executive government including the military national authority thereof will recognize and maintain in other words we're going to back you you will have the authority of the strongest government on american soil the federal government the freedom of such persons and here's a kicker so that's what lincoln is going to do this is the preliminary emancipation will do no act or act to repress such persons in other words enforce the fugitive slave act or any of them, and here's their part, in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. They have to make that effort in order for Lincoln to do his part. So the answer has always been not or, but and. Lincoln deserves the appellation of great emancipator because without his authority and the army and navy, any self-emancipation would have come, would have kept them as fugitives from justice, if you will, legal justice in the states from which uh, they fled. Um, it needed both. Oh, and by the way, James Oakes makes this explicit in his book, Freedom National. He said, you know where most of the states, excuse me, 
Do you know where most of the slaves freed themselves? Where there was a Union Army, where there was a Union Navy, where those weren't all in evidence, fewer and fewer slaves took a chance of fleeing. They themselves recognized they had to hightail it to a federal authority. And by the time January 1 comes along, 1863, now they know for certain that the federal government is on their side. Well, I, I, I'm gonna have to, uh, uh, to apologize to our attendees. We have answered 16 of your questions. There are, there are 38 of them, 38 of them still open. There's no <laughs> way we're gonna get to all of these or even most of these, um, but there are a bunch of questions related to reaction to the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, several have asked about the effect it had on foreign nations. What did the abolitionists think? What did people in the border states think? Uh, other segments of the population. So uh, here's a big open-ended question. What was, the, what's the, what, what was the reaction to the Emancipation Proclamation? Lucas, you want to get started? I mean, I know just okay. very broad strokes. I know that it was understood almost immediately for its, its impact. I think people understood what it meant constitutionally. They understood what it meant for the near, maybe not for the long term, but they certainly understood what it meant for the near future in the war. Uh, but in terms of international reaction, I don't know, don't know too much. Well, well I'll, I'll stick to the home front. Uh, it's the most important one. Um, it was a controversial action by Lincoln. Uh, Republicans lost in state elections that year. Uh, in other words, what looks like a slam dunk as it ought to from our 21st century perspective at the time, highly controversial that you could touch property through a federal edict. Yow, right? Um, it was highly controversial. Here's a, a great example. One of the two dissenters in Dred Scott, right? That awful Supreme Court decision that said blacks couldn't be citizens. Congress didn't have authority to free slaves uh, in the territory and therefore the Missouri Compromise uh, was unconstitutional. Um, two, there's two dissenters, John McLean and Benjamin Curtis. Benjamin Curtis from New England. I mean, his New England bona fides are unimpeachable. He publishes a pamphlet, it's like 80, 90 pages long, called Executive Power, where he excoriates Lincoln, condemns Lincoln for, you know, trying civilians in military courts, you know, closing presses down, and for issuing an unauthorized, unconstitutional emancipation proclamation. So this isn't a copperhead, let alone a rebel publishing this pamphlet. This is Benjamin Curtis, whose last opinion was the Dred Scott opinion, okay? Uh, so this is a guy who, who doesn't have it in for Lincoln, per se. And so he, and, and there was a battle among the lawyers in the press in terms of the legality, the constitutionality of the Emancipation Proclamation. So the short versions, it was not a slam dunk. It lost elections for Republicans in, in certain states. Um, now, you know, to, to look at it the other way, the other side, Frederick Douglass said, he would give it three and a half out of five stars, I think. He loved the fact that Lincoln followed through, right? Lincoln promised to do this in September. We'll see. Will he come through, right? They had watch parties on December 31st, waiting to hear for, as they say, lightning to strike. They were waiting on January 1st for the earliest signal that from the telegraph that, did he really do it? Did he really? Did he really emancipate slaves? And Douglas didn't like the fact that he made those exceptions. He was like Chase, right? He's an abolitionist. He thinks that the institution should be completely eradicated. He thinks Lincoln can't win the war unless he makes it an abolition war. Changes his mind when he delivers that speech in 1876. So among abolitionists, they of course, they'll take it, but it wasn't the whole loaf and they want the whole loaf. Um, but politically, um, and Alan Gelzo's book does a good job of showing that it was, it was um, not the obvious uh, political slam dunk that people today uh, think think it was. Let's say something quickly to add to that about the property argument. I mean, remember that a, a large assumption that's going on in the proclamation is you're depriving the rebellion of its slave property and impairing its war effort. And yep. so under international law and traditionally, anytime we talked about fighting a war, you could deprive the enemy of its property. But usually we're talking there about a foreign enemy. And so at the same time, Lincoln has also said these people were never out of the Union. And so civil war creates some real sticky yep. problems for thinking about the, the, the legality of what you're doing in war. And so a lot of that pushback was, I thought you said they weren't out of the union. Now you're confiscating property of people. Well, they're disloyal. Well, but they're still in the union. You're not a, a foreign enemy. And that, of course, would resonate later 
and Lincoln's plans for you know what later would be called Reconstruction. Do you treat them as a conquered enemy as you would a foreign power, or do you treat them as people within your family that have done something wrong? And so that's one problem. Also with the abolitionists, the mere fact that Lincoln is leaning so heavily on the property argument is a problem for many because they've been trying to draw out for years and years and years that legal absurdity of treating someone as person and property at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you read the letter to Conkling, for example, around the same time, it's as if Lincoln says, okay, you want to say slaves are property? Fantastic. Now I'm going to take your property. There's mm -hmm. a sense in which he concedes a kind of notion that slaves are merely property in the eyes of law. Therefore, we can confiscate it. And so he goes down the road, a legal road that he had resisted in some ways, especially in response to Dred Scott, which is to say that there's no um, you know, constitutional, indefeasible principle of slaves merely as property and not persons, something like yeah. that. So it's a weird, it's a weird legal argument that's going on. That's part of the reason you have this pushback um, in, in certain quarters, among other reasons. How, Im how uh, important was the Emancipation Proclamation to the outbreak of the New York City draft riots in, later in 1863? Uh, my take on that, the draft riots were principally, uh, um, well, uh, I guess I jumped into that one too quickly. I mean, the, the draft riots were about the draft. I mean, it was, um, Unfortunately, it, would, it affected a particular, or was expressed by a particular portion, an ethnic portion of the New York population, chiefly the Irish, you know, new Im immigrants, um, who didn't like the. the it's St. Patrick's Day, so we need. I to know. Talk about the guy. I'm not wearing any Trent. green. That's all. Or yeah, pretend it's yeah. green. You can't tell. Uh, so yeah, I'm doubling down on my anti. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but um, they 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 didn't like the fact that they were being drafted uh, for what was now being considered an abolition war. Um, but I mean, that's, uh, um, I'm, I'm not so sure in the grand scheme of things, uh, that that was at least historically a very pivotal event. It was awful what happened to black people in New York. They were massacred by the scores. Um, and in fact, what put it down was, uh, troops from the fresh from Gettysburg that were sent up there, uh, uh to put down that, um, that, uh, lynch, lynch mob, lynch mobs. Yeah, I Jason, couldn't add any more than that. I, I couldn't add any more than that. I don't know of any, and maybe it's just my own blind spot, but I don't know of any sort of smoking gun piece of literature or or speech or essay or you know even a secondary article, um, other than to say you know just a kind of general no nothingism that would have been sort of mixed into that into that that cake. Um, but as far as something pinpointing the Emancipation Proclamation as some pivotal event, I'm just not aware of anything. Doesn't mean it's not out there. I, I don't. I don't make a habit of of weighing in on these as a moderator. Um, I, I feel like I can say something or offer something, maybe just to get shot down about the international impact. Oh, thank you. That, that one of the that one of the motives here was to uh, was to deal with the concern that uh, that that Great Britain might recognize the Confederacy that had shown certain sympathy toward it. But once you made this a war about slavery. Uh, there was no way that the that 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 the that the, the the population of the UK was going to get behind supporting the South. I don't know if you can if if you reject that theory or the England is an interesting case because there's not one uh, one authority to look to. You've got the Queen's declaration of neutrality, and as long as she didn't as long as she didn't recognize the Confederacy as a belligerent a belligerent nation per se you know, we were okay with that neutrality, ugh. but, but, but she didn't recognize that in a de facto way they had become their own country. If, if she did, that would have massively complicated uh, the war effort because then they could openly do what they were doing covertly, which is yeah. getting them to build ships and, and, and munitions, et cetera. Um, so you had some members of parliament who were in favor of it, some who were not. And, and surprisingly, even though it hit their pocketbook, the working class in the UK was sympathetic to the union cause. Uh, remember what, what happened at the outset of the war, and this was a huge mistake by Jefferson Davis. He thought if he embargoed cotton, that it would cripple England and England would have to recognize them as an independent nation and therefore um, uh, would, would um, kowtow to them to get that cotton. But but they went they 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 went without well what happened was actually England had a surplus, <laughs> so his reconnaissance wasn't very good. Is what little I know about this is he declared an embargo at the absolute wrong time, and so when the war began, 
Um, England wasn't flush, but they had enough. They could do without it. And then they discovered this long staple cotton in Egypt and they, 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 they work around it. Uh, but England, it's, it, it deserves its own article, which I cannot recommend to you, but it would be easy to find, which deals just with, with, with England. And France was not gonna do anything unless England did and ditto for Russia. So England really led, led there. And so, but with England, you got the monarchy, but then you have parliament and then you have uh, the commons. There you go, got them all. Uh, well, I don't have the Lords, but at any rate, um, it, 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 you, you can't just point to, oh, declaration of neutrality, that's England's policy. Well, yes and no. John, I can't top that. <laughs> well, good thing because we are at the end of our time. <laughs> I just wanna invite each of you to, to make, make some kind of final statement about, uh, about this document. <laughs> I'll just you know, repeat in some ways what I said at the beginning. I, I really enjoy teaching this piece with, with students um, for a lot of reasons, but probably first and foremost, and just thinking a bit about what statesmanship looks like. There's a tendency on the part of people that are interested in ideas and political history to always sort of think of statesmanship as being the grand speech on top of a mountain, beautiful political rhetoric, et cetera. And I think this is a good example of statesmanship in the trenches. This is a good example of what statesmanship has to look like when you're dealing with um, the law, with the rule of law, constitutionalism. And um, so it's something I've found very useful over the years. And just I'm a Lincoln junkie as well. So it's just something that I've really enjoyed using with students. And it's, it's really shaped the way that I think about what Lincoln was doing um, in 1863. Yeah, I, 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 the easy thing would just be to say mega dittos at this point. Um, and, and Jason's <laughs> approach is precisely my approach when I teach Lincoln every year in my Lincoln seminar. Um, we have a whole class, there should be a, um, a whole course on this, but we have a whole class where we look at, actually it's probably two classes, two sessions, where we look at how Lincoln got to emancipation. And so uh, I don't think you get the, 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 the sense of Lincoln's statesmanship by just simply looking at that document. You've got to see what was his initial, he went through several plans. I don't know if Emancipation Proclamation was plan C or plan D, uh, but he, he it, because there were other approaches to emancipation, these were not indications, as was mentioned earlier, that Lincoln was a reluctant emancipator. It was how serious he took the actual liberation of human lives uh, that it had to be done in a particular way. So that's very, dis that's distinctively American about the way Lincoln uh, did it. The, the emphasis on the constitution, the emphasis on delegated authority, the emphasis on representing the consent of the people. Um, just one line is classic for me in, in the actual Emancipation Proclamation. Um, Lincoln's draft, um, this was after the September uh, preliminary one, his draft didn't have anything about, and it's really awesome that we're doing this, right? I think Chase or Seward, it's always Chase or Seward, who says, Lincoln, you've got, and it's got probably Chase, you've got to say something about the awesomeness of this. And that's, and so what do they, what does Lincoln do? The last line, Upon this act sincerely believed to be an act of justice, and he doesn't stop there. What does he hasten to add? Warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity. And then he goes back to the cool part. I invoke the considerate judgment, notice, not of the American people, the considerate judgment of mankind. That's what I was hinting at when I said earlier that Lincoln understood what he was doing was world historic and the gracious favor of almighty God. In other words, I'm going to need providence on this one because I've issued it. It's January 1, but as far as I can tell, this war is not exactly going to be over in the next week or two. We're going to need some things to break for us. All right, this hour has just flown by. I want to thank both of our, our panelists, Lucas and Jason, as well as our participants for these fantastic questions. Yes, absolutely. Uh, just as a reminder, you'll be receiving an email within the next week that will include a link for a certificate of participation, if you would like one. It will also contain a link to the archived webinar. We hope you will share that link with your colleagues and get it out there on social media. This has been an amazing hour and, and, and it deserves to be circulated widely. If you have enjoyed tonight's webinar, please consider taking an online graduate course in our Master of Arts in American History and Government program. As I said at the outset, both Lucas and Jason teach in that, uh, in that, in that program. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a terrific one, really. Uh, you can find more information about our online course offerings or our on-campus course offerings, as well as all sorts of other resources for teachers at teachingamericanhistory.org. 
Our next Documents in Detail webinar will take place on Wednesday, April 21st. On that occasion, our topic will be Abraham Lincoln's resolution submitting the 13th Amendment to the states. So a, a very important, good follow-up to what we're uh, talking about tonight. Joining me to discuss it at that time will be Elizabeth Amato of Gardner-Webb University and Andrew Lang of Mississippi State University. Yay. We look forward to seeing you back here on uh, the evening of April 21st. Until then, have a great evening. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our free programs, resources, and our documents collection for teachers, students, and citizens at teachingamericanhistory or tah.org.